welcome back to Connect Rheumatology. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Ortiz. Thank you so much for being here. If you're new to the channel, welcome. We talk about all things rheumatology, immunology, diet and movement, and mental health and wellness because we believe it's all connected. We also believe that everyone deserves to participate in their own care. And the first step to doing that is educating yourself as much as possible about your condition, your treatments, and what you can do to help yourself. That is really the best way to partner with your doctor to get you moving forward to feeling better. And that's what we do here at Connected Rheumatology. If that sounds good to you, make sure you hit subscribe, the like button, the bell notification, all those good things. It helps us get in front of more eyes so that we can give this information to as many people as possible. So today we're going to be talking about a condition that I know is very confusing to people and that is MCTD or a mixed connective tissue disorder. We're gonna talk about what it is, what it isn't, and all those details, so stick around. Okay, so MCTD is very confusing, and not just to patients, to doctors too. I can't even count how many discharge papers I have seen from emergency rooms or from urgent cares on my patients who have MCTD but yet it's listed as lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. And to be fair to my ER and urgent care colleagues, a lot of times for whatever the reason was they went to, the patient went to the urgent care, it's not particularly useful information to know the distinction between MCTD and lupus. But for me, in my clinic as a rheumatologist, it's very important. And if you happen to be dealing with MCTD or a similar type condition, or perhaps you're confused about whether or not you have MCT or MCTD or not, the distinction is actually very important. Okay, so what is MCTD? Well, to understand MCTD and how we came to characterize it is really to understand all of rheumatology. And so I'm gonna to try to break it down in like three or four minutes. So we'll see how that goes. Okay, so I'm gonna step back for a minute and talk about lupus. How did we even come to identify lupus? Well, basically what happened was a very observant doctor or doctors started noticing a collection of patients that all had very similar symptoms. They all had this butterfly rash, they all were losing their hair, had joint pain, some of them would go into kidney failure, and they started noticing, hey, all these patients kind of look the same on the outside. So they started collecting them, writing papers, doing research on them, and they decided that they all kind of fall under this category that they called lupus. And once it's given a name, right, giving it a name is actually a very important step, they can then move forward in doing more research and more studies. And not only were they researching the symptoms, but they were doing a lot of blood studies. They were looking at what's going on in the blood. And what they found was that in some, actually most of these patients, not all, but most of these patients, they all seem to have certain autoantibodies and back then the main one was the ANA. So you can see it's going from the outside, so from symptoms that they can see, to then studies that show them, oh in fact all these people or a lot of these people have this particular protein, this autoantibody. They then take those patients and they study them even more and they then look at certain pathways and other more, more nuanced proteins within the immune system. And that's kind of the phase we're in now where we're trying to understand processes and pathways within the physiology of these lupus patients. As you're getting more specific in your research and your, the research within the immune system and the blood work, you are actually finding that that big group of patients you thought were all the same are actually not. And that is how we end up with so many different variations of a condition because we started from the outside and worked our way in. And so that's why we always say every lupus patient is different because every lupus patient is different. And it's, it, 
lends itself to conditions where you have a group of people who are all very different because they were actually identified by symptoms as opposed to protein dysregulation. You could see how if it went the other way, if we identified the protein that was dysregulated or the process that, that was dysregulated and then worked our way out to then finding patients with certain symptoms, you would actually end up with a group of patients who were much more similar. So, but that's just not the way medical science works. We don't work from the inside out, usually. We work from the outside in. Okay, so in that framework, let's talk about MCTV. So in the 70s, it had been, you know, gathering steam, gathering information that there was a group of patients that seemed to have what they called an overlap syndrome. So they had a little bit of lupus, a little bit of myositis, and a little bit of scleroderma. And for a long time, it was just like, oh, well, they have an overlap. And that's not uncommon in rheumatology for patients to have a little bit of this and a little bit of that. You know, again, we always try to be as specific as possible with our diagnoses, but sometimes it's just not possible. So, okay, so this, it's this overlap syndrome, but it was becoming clear that mm, this isn't just a one-off. This isn't just like a patient here and there. There's actually a large collection of patients who have these same findings. And what really cinched it was when they did the internal research, the research into the blood work, they found that they were all united in having this one autoantibody that was actually very high. And it's called the anti-RNP antibody. And so after much discussion and much hoopla, it was finally kind of decided that in fact this isn't just some overlap syndrome that happens occasionally this is an entire condition in and of itself and that we need to name it as such and hence mixed connective tissue disorder so what are those symptoms that are overlapped well it's lupus myositis and scleroderma so lupus Got plenty of videos on that. There's lots of information you can find out about lupus. Scleroderma, I have some videos on that as well. Haven't really broached myositis, it's coming, but just as a basics, just break up the word. Myo is muscle, itis is inflammation. It's simply inflammation of the muscles. Now, myositis can happen in and of itself as part of lupus, as part of RA, as part of Sjogren's. Um, it can be a symptom of a lot of autoimmune conditions. It can also be its own condition. You have a condition called polymyositis and dermatomyositis where the main symptoms are muscle inflammation and not muscle inflammation from head to toe, but muscle inflammation that happens in a very distinctive pattern, meaning it's the muscles we call them in medicine, the proximal muscles, the muscles closest to the trunk. So it's gonna be the muscles of the upper arm and the muscles of the upper leg. And it's not so much pain as much as weakness. And so in general, that's what myositis is. So patients with MCTD can have symptoms of all these three conditions. But what can make things confusing and frustrating is they typically don't have these symptoms all at the same time. They happen over time. And it's for this reason sometimes patients might start out with the diagnosis of lupus. And then with time, as more symptoms show themselves, it becomes more clear that actually it's not lupus they have, it's MCTD. I hope all of this makes sense. So one of the more common symptoms someone might have at the beginning of their MCTD journey, well, very similar to lupus. People can have rashes, hair loss, fatigue, joint pain, Raynaud's or Raynaud's, depending on how, where you live. If, and if you don't know what that is, I have a video down in the subscription box. All of these symptoms can be presenting symptoms for both lupus, scleroderma, and MCTD. It's also important to note that as time goes on, things can morph. So someone with MCTD who never really had much muscle inflammation could then develop muscle inflammation one, two, three, even five or more years into their journey. And it's really kind of understanding this that is key to helping you identify when things change early so you can get a jump on it and start treatment, start the appropriate treatment. 
Now, I just was talking about how these symptoms are very similar to lupus and scleroderma. So then how do you actually make a diagnosis of MCTD? Well, one of them is with time, which is frustrating. But the other key is this anti-RNP antibody, otherwise known as U1-RNP. Now, this antibody is an antibody that's attracted to the substance within our nucleus. So it is considered an anti-nuclear antibody. It is one of the types of ANAs. And it was found that really the unifying factor with all these patients who had this overlap MCTD syndrome was having a very high titer or a high result of the anti-RNP. So does that mean everyone with the anti-RNP antibody has MCTD? Of course not, of course not. If you have watched any of my videos, especially any videos on antibodies, you will know that it is very rare for any antibody to be the slam dunk diagnosis antibody. Certainly people can have low or moderate levels of anti-RNP and not have MCTD. But if you have a very high level of anti-RNP, of course, the definition of high level really is dependent on the lab that you have it done with, and they have a reference range. But if you have a very high level of an anti-RNP antibody and you have correlating symptoms such as rash, fatigue, joint pain, Raynaud's, anything like that, then it will be very high on your doctor's suspicion list that they need to be thinking about MCTD or mixed connective tissue disorder. Okay, so again, always like to bring it back to you. What does any of this matter? What does all this nuance of like myositis and scleroderma and lupus, like it's all, isn't it all the same? Well, no. It's not. Um, obviously, we always like to be as specific as possible when we're making a diagnosis. But it also is very important when we think about prognosis and the road that someone might be on with their particular condition. And the road someone is on with MCTD is very different than the lupus road. And so the distinction is actually very important. MCTD is not lupus. A key point here is that there are certain complications and certain things that we need to look out for in someone who has MCTD, specifically complications that can happen in the lung and in the heart that are just not as common in someone with lupus. On the flip side, Patients with MCTD don't tend to get a lot of kidney issues as opposed to what we worry about with lupus patients. And all this to say that if someone develops a cough or trouble breathing and their diagnosis is MCTD, that kind of gets your doctor thinking about a whole different area of testing and concerns and what they need to look out for, which would be different than what you would think about in someone with lupus. So yeah, the distinction is important. Now, similar to lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, we have some excellent treatments for MCTD. The flip side is we also run into some of the same obstacles that we do with scleroderma. And getting into the nuance of treatments with MCTD is really kind of beyond what this video is about. And really the treatment of MCTD is going to be difficult to do in any YouTube video because the treatment is so individualized. As you can see, there are a lot of different directions someone with MCTD could go. You have lupus, you have myositis, and you have scleroderma. And someone could be diagnosed with MCTD and their main issues be scleroderma-like. And on the other end, you could have someone with MCTD whose main issues are myositis-like and their treatments are going to be very different. And so you can see how it really is hard to kind of summarize all that and put a nice bow on it because it really is super personalized. But that's where understanding what you have, what your condition is, what your manifestations are, like how does your doctor think about you? Yes, you have MCTD, but are you like 
lupusy? Are you myositis? Is that the driver? Are you scleroderma? And that's really how I like to frame mixed connective tissue dis disorder, is what is driving us right now? And that might change over time. Perhaps we have a lot of lung inflammation and joint inflammation, and that's really what's driving it right now, and so our treatment's gonna be focused on that. Or maybe things over time shift, and what's driving it now is scleroderma-like features, lung problems, and that's going to drive treatment. So if you happen to have MCTD, I think a really good question to ask your doctor when talking about next steps and talking about treatments is, what exactly or how do you think about my condition and what is the driving force behind your decision making about what treatments I may or may not need or what testing I may or may not need. I think that's a good way of trying to simplify the way we think about it because MCTD can get really big and complicated because we have all of these different conditions it may or may not be but really trying to simplify and be like well in you what is really the driving force what is really the main symptom the main complication the main issue that is bringing you to the doctor's office and and having them kind of think about treatments to calm down that makes sense? I hope it makes sense. I know MCTD can be very confusing, not only to patients, but believe me, doctors get confused too. Um, and I really just wanted to shed some light on it, answer some questions that I know people have, I've gotten over the years, and really try to reframe it in a way that's a little digestible and understandable. And like I said, if you can wrap your brain around how they came around to kind of identifying what MCTD was, um, then you've really kind of done a lot of work because that's the same that way that we've approached all of our conditions. So I hope you found this useful. I hope um, you got something out of it. If you liked it, make sure you hit subscribe, hit the bell, hit the like, share it. That's always a great thing to do too. Um, here at Connect Rheumatology, we talk about all things rheumatology, immunology, diet, and movement, mental health, and wellness because we believe it is all connected. Thanks and have a great day.